We all know that our current customers are a huge asset to our organization. It is more profitable for us to keep long-term customers than to continually churn our base and having to go find new logos. Many of the clients that we work with, actually their quotas are set to growth or incremental increases to the revenue that they bring in, not just a pure revenue number. Customer replacement is expensive because it costs more to acquire a customer usually than to keep a customer. And while in the value selling framework, we often talk about the fundamental principle, people need a reason to change when you're selling something new. In the context of the renewal, people need a reason to stay. And so we'll, we'll spend some time about that. One of the biggest fallacies that I often see certain um, account managers or customer success reps make is they assume that if they're using the service or the product or the subscription or the SaaS platform, that equals value. And utilization may not always equal value. Sometimes we assume that if they've been using it and they haven't complained, of course, the renewal is solid. May or may not be true. Oftentimes, we also have to deal with the fact that maybe their realization and experience of becoming a client was different than their expectation when they signed up. Because anytime somebody is doing something new, it's change and change is hard. And again, past value doesn't necessarily guarantee anticipated future value. We're going to talk about some of the keys to driving customer retention. And we know in many organizations, this is all about striking a balance. We have hunters and we have farmers. Some of you on this line may have a very defined role that's one or the other. The hunter being the new logo acquisition, the farmer being the care and nurturing and expansion and growing of that base. And we need to understand that there's equal effort to be put into that. And I'm just going to ask you this question. Maybe you can share it from your point of view in the organizations that you work with. Where do you put the rigor in that process? Is there more rigor in a defined sales process for new business acquisition? Is there more rigor or defined process in the renewal processes and customer retention process? Or are they equal? Share with me what your thoughts are on that in the um, in the chat column here, if you if you don't mind, or the Q and A column, and we'll look at that. Many organizations that we deal with they treat customer acquisition a little bit differently than new business, and uh, we'll talk about why that might put their customer acquisition in a little in a little jeopardy but i it, it, i'm um, encouraged to see that there's equal rig rigor in both of those processes let's face it we're we've moved to a subscription based economy saas and saas models even if you're not selling software but the subscription nature of what we do i have a friend who has a a, a, a new baby and she's now getting her baby food on subscription. I get my multivitamins on subscription. We are in a complete subscription economy right now. So thank you for sharing some of your point of view in your mix. So one of the things that we find is a best practice and the key that we're going to start to talk about is we want consistency in approach and process between that new business and that renewal business. Why? It creates a better customer experience. It also creates a better common approach and better um, handoffs and collaboration between the hunters and the farmers or the new business sales reps and the customer success managers that are doing the renewals. Our goal is to create a, custom, a frictionless customer experience. Um, how do we do that? Common language, common skill set, common focus, common mindset as to how we approach our customers and add value in our interactions with them. And in our opinion, we find it is best to do that from a customer out focus as opposed to an internal 
out to the customer focus. What do I mean by that? We want to be flexible enough in our processes that we can tailor them and support our buyers and our customers and clients wherever they are. And we want to do that based on reverse engineering how people buy. No one wants to be sold. Julie shared that the, um, the situation that, that she just experienced in the last four weeks. And yet a sales rep with an agenda that wasn't taken into account that our needs and requirements had changed. So rather than try to recreate a solution that met our current reality, which was quite frankly, quite a bit different than 12 months ago, they were trying to renew as is, and they were at risk because they weren't understanding what we're doing. So we want to do that based on what, how people buy and, and make sure that we're meeting them where, where they're at. And the reasons they bought the first time may not be the same reasons that they'll buy in the future. The people who bought the first time may not be the same people who will buy in the future. And in today's dynamic world, that is a reality that we have to deal with in our account management and customer success worlds. So what are we gonna talk about today? We're gonna to talk about the importance of a solid customer retention strategy and how we can increase the likelihood that we can minimize unanticipated cancellations and uncontrollable cancellations to increase the likelihood that we have a higher retention rate. Now, there are going to always be some level of, of cancellations that are out of our control. A company goes out of business. A company gets acquired and therefore they are consolidating um, contracts or maybe um, the acquiring company has a different approach to the, the platforms or the, the tools and services that you provide. We're not talking about how we deal with the uncontrollable. We're really going to talk about how we focus on the things that we, as account managers, customer success managers, whatever your title is, are able to um, manage and control and mitigate the probability that somebody wants to make a change. And we're going to do that with some proactive strategies and best practices that I'm going to share with you, both from my own own career as well as others that I've worked with over the years. And we're going to talk about how we can also parlay that into expanding our footprint in the wallet share that we have with those clients. Um, and all of that ends up being related to having a consistent approach to how we engage our customers. And customer retention is, is no different that we want to do that. So why do people cancel to begin with? Well, really there's, there's two main reasons and you can put some nuances into this, but there's two main buckets that people cancel. Either we didn't get what we expect, expected and it didn't work the way we anticipated or something along those lines. And therefore we might be dissatisfied or seeking something new or something's changed. The business could have evolved. The priorities could have evolved. The people could have changed. How many of you as account managers end up finding out that when you get into that renewal cycle, you're talking to someone that you might not have ever spoken to before because of a reorganization or somebody got promoted or, you know, the, or COVID. Great point. Things have changed. Processes have changed and it happens all the time, Crystal, absolutely. And we need to uncover that um, and not take for granted that why they bought in the first place is why they're going to continue with us. So we need to what we call requalify the opportunity. And we use the value selling framework and the same rigor that we use to create and qualify and an, a new logo or a new business opportunity. We can use that to requalify our renewals. Because we want to know, should they continue to buy with, from us? Do we still solve problems and address issues that are important to them? And do we do that in a unique and superior way? Because let's not be confused. Our competitors are finding out when our contracts expire and trying to displace us. They will be going in and trying to incent 
our prospects to make a change. So again, we need to find reasons for them to stay. And the reasons they bought in the first place may not be the same exact reasons that they're buying today. And definitely if there's different people involved, they may not articulate them the same way. We also need to uncover the value of staying with us. And while it's important to know that we add value in the past, they paid for the past and they expected that value in the past. We now have to focus on the future anticipated value that they will continue to realize by continuing the partnership. Um, absolutely. And budget is important, it, it is, as I'm seeing here in, in chat, but budget doesn't define value. Let me say that again. Budget doesn't define value. Um, we may have to understand if that's a constraint that we have to work in, but that is not part of necessarily the qualification uh, process because in my experience, if someone with authority wants something bad enough, they'll change the budget unless we're so far out of the realm of possibility and I'm selling a million dollar solution to a, you know, a company with $100,000 worth of revenue. We also have to re-qualify along the lines of who's involved with the decision-making process. One thing we know for sure with COVID is nothing as, as, is as it was a year ago. Organizations have changed, empowerment has changed, business processes have changed, companies, depending on the industry that they're in, are either struggling or thriving, but they're putting different levels of rigor in this distributed virtual world into procurement processes. So we need to identify those people. This is a whole new sales cycle. Your renewal is a whole new sales cycle um, to do that. We also need to understand what the timing is. Clearly, we've got a, a, a deadline associated with, um, with our current agreement um, um, terminating or expiring. Um, but we also want to know how we're going to work with their timing and the steps involved to make sure they're continuing to move forward. So key number one that I will share with you is I think it's just as important to qualify the opportunity with the rigor of the qualified prospect formula that we use in our um, new business opportunities. And often the challenge that we deal with with renewals is we make assumptions because we have experience. I was talking to a sales rep last week who, was, who, who said it better than anybody um, I've heard say, is we have to be careful to not let our experience become our enemy. Um, because what, then we get in our own way and we stop asking questions and we start making assumptions. So the second key that we're gonna talk about is the renewal starts from the day they sign the first contract. It is not an event that happens towards the end of the contract. It happens from the beginning. It starts with a successful onboarding initiative to make sure that everybody understands how to exploit and get the most impact from the functionality of whatever we sold them. We want to also be continually strengthening the relationship in order to also expand the relationship. Who else should I be talking to in your organization? Oftentimes at the very beginning of a new client relationship, when it gets handed over to the customer success manager, we document our outreach process. I've seen clients that have a calendar, if you will, that says at month one, here's the activities I'm going to do with you. Month two, here's the activities. Month three, we're going to do a check-in and I'm going to uh, reconfirm that you're getting what you expected to get. And we out, um, document that process. Now, the key to that process is it has to add value to your customer or your client, right? It can't just be about us checking off the box that I called you and did a howdy duty is everything good, but we also want to make sure that we're adding value to them. I have one prospect actually earlier this morning that shared with me that in throughout the course of the contract, he's always asked, asking them, um, if you had to rate how things are going right now on a scale of one to 10, what would it be? 
And he said, unless we're failing miserably, it's usually, you know, towards the high end of the 10. And then the follow on question that he asks every time is what would it take to bring us to a 20? And he's, he's always amazed at how he then learns where the specific opportunities are for him to improve the relationship, their service delivery, or something like that. So I thought that was an excellent. And asking that early gives you the runway to address something. Maybe it's a misunderstanding. Maybe it's a missed expectation on their part. They, they thought they were getting something that was never gonna be able to be delivered. The earlier you can identify that, the better you are, off you are. Every interaction with the client is an opportunity to learn. Every interaction with the client is an opportunity to listen to what they need. And we can leverage the same techniques that we use in selling with open probe and confirm questions throughout all of our dialogues. This is not about us telling them how valuable we are. This is not about us telling them that we're the best solution for them. This is about us facilitating the dialogue so they come to that conclusion with us. We always think we're the best because aren't we? Of course we are. We're the best solution for them. So it begins with the first contact, Bef you know, oftentimes with the customer experience before they're the customer. Um, if for, for those of you that know value selling well and know how to do it, we focus those conversations on the future and value realization. We paint a picture in the sales cycle about what that future will be after they become a client. And that allows us to focus on managing expectations, delivering those solutions, adding value and maintaining and building on that relationship. Absolutely, so that is the key. It's a process, it's not an event. It starts at the beginning, not at the end of the, the contract. And to the extent that you can think about this as ongoing processes and ways to move forward, you are gonna be better at identifying ways to make sure that you're giving your prospects reasons to stay. So one of the fundamental principles in the value selling framework is people buy from people. And we know that for people to buy from people, we have to be credible, we have to develop rapport, we have to dis d establish trust. You know, credibility means that we're believable and we're, we're truth tellers, right? We're not embellishing, we're not making things up. Um, rapport means that we see things the same way, we're on the same page. It allows us to have empathy with those prospects. And the way we demonstrate that is through our communication skills and our behaviors. We listen, we understand, we're accountable, we communicate. And communication is, it is, is much dependent on our listening skills as it is on our speaking skills. And I, I see many sales reps think about, oh, I'm a great presenter. I can talk to anybody. I, I you know, I love people. Um, and all of those are great things to say, but, but in these types of situations, it's just as important that we understand and their point of view. And the only way we do that is if we listen. Um, we don't learn anything when we talk. So the second key, as I mentioned, is our ability to set expectations. That's clear expectations on what the client's gonna get. Again, this is why this starts during the sales cycle to make sure we have phenomenal customer experience. Um, I used to work with somebody who said, you know, we don't need hit and run sales reps. We don't need someone to close them and disappear. Um, and, um, and so be careful of that. Um, anything you can do to maintain checking in it's amazing to me how many people i will buy something in december and nobody calls me in january or february even to thank me let alone to say is how's it going do you have any questions is there anything i can do to help you make sure that you get this implemented um, in time now some of that's changing because organizations have created these customer sex uh, success groups to drive those types of activities. But it becomes a real good opportunity for us to reinforce all the great reasons that they decided to buy from us in the first place. 
and leads into that critical onboarding as we talked as well. Managing expectations early and often is key to making sure that we have a strong relationship and that they don't have a reason to change. Remember, our goal is to create reasons to stay. So examples of that, you know, how do we add value? How do we delight our customers by giving them unexpected goodies? Could be content, it could be, um, it can be anything, but are we thinking about adding value both the, the company level um, as well as to the individuals that are part, are, we're building these relationships with? It's so, so important and often positions us to meet those needs. Sometimes, and I've run into this, and I'm sure some of you um, do as well, if I'm not talking to the customer to understand what their evolving needs are, I might not understand if there's additional opportunity for me to provide solutions to them. Sometimes the customer doesn't even know that they might have needs that could be met by us. So we're constantly trying to understand, hey, what's going on? What's new? What's changing? What's evolving? How can I best support you? Um, maybe, you know, six months into a software platform SaaS subscription, um, there's new functionality that you've added that the customer might have missed in the email that came out that told them to do that, or might have missed in the documentation or the notes, the release notes that came out. So can we, can we talk about that in a way to anticipate needs that they might not have even shared with us? But the whole point of this continuous conversation is to make sure we are adding value to the individual. I mean, these people are, are busy. No one needs another meeting in their life if it doesn't give them something that's valuable to them. Um, and if we're just checking off the box and saying, hey, I'm checking in, everything good, great, and then they go away, we might not get any information that will help us in the long run. So the third key is alignment. And I have seen this bite some sales reps right in the butt. They sold the wrong problem to begin with, saw wrong product to begin with. They didn't understand the real problems that that prospect was trying to sell. They, they jumped to solution quickly, had a little sizzle on that solution, got them to jump, and then the prospect said, wait a second, this isn't what I thought it was. So one of the things that we need to make sure we're doing from the very beginning is making sure that we're a good fit. We are never successful if we take a round peg and stick it in a square hole for a long time. We might get some short term bump, but in long term, we're going to have a very frustrated customer. So making sure that alignment is there, reconfirming all those reasons, anticipating buyer remorse through that and making sure we're mitigating that um, early on in the process is really, really important. Um, uh, and, and I've seen it happen. I've seen some companies being told, you know, 60 days after making a purchase, oh my God, this isn't what I thought it was. You know, A, if you're not gonna let me out of the contract, I'm telling you right now, I'm out. I'm out at the end. And, and, and so we wanna make sure that is. So examples of that allow you to reinforce in your communication what's going on. And again, if we listen, we can do that. And there's a good point here in chat. Um, from Chris, which I absolutely agree with, and often it happens. The person who buys the technology isn't the person who has to implement it. And so all of a sudden there's a disconnect between the people that have to use the product and make it work and the decision makers. Now, in some cases, companies are very aligned and that works, but in other companies, I've called on some dysfunctional organizations over, over the years where the right hand does not know what the left hand is doing. So if that alignment happens, then we often have to resell, even though they've already bought, the people that are critical to the success of the implementation and the utilization of whatever the products and services that we sold. 
As a matter of fact, we have organizations that bring the value selling framework in just to help their customer success organizations get buy-in from the implementation teams to get the whole thing implemented in the first place. In the old hardware days, um, it, it used to be, if you were selling big hardware machines, you couldn't recognize the revenue until your prospect turned the machine on. And so we had a client once that was dealing with the, the problem of they were shipping all these this hardware was into hospital space, into hospitals, and they were sitting out on the loading deck. And, and uh, since they were on the loading deck, they weren't getting plugged in, they weren't getting turned on, and they could not recognize the revenue until the customer, um, it, they called it the go live date, until they went live. So we had to create a whole new sales process to get them bought into that. So very good things that we need to uncover. The more questions we ask, the better the information we have in understanding how we can be the best partner they've ever had. Um, you know, one of the prin principles underlying the foundation of the value selling framework is the product is in the mind of the buyer. And, you know, the right solution to the wrong problem won't solve anything. And we, we, many of us, if we've been around a little while, have seen that. So um, making sure that we are taking the time sometimes to do the right alignment, make sure we have what we call a strong vision match, which means not that we just understand that they love our solution, but that we are also in agreement to the problems that solves and the reasons those problems are worth solving. And when we have that confirmation, that triad of confirmation, we are much better at making sure that we are not missing expectations. And I'll just throw this out here, a little question, share, share it in chat. Is the customer always right? Have you ever run into situations where you were working with someone, you thought you had an agreement and something went haywire? So the question is, is the customer always right? Any of you on the East Coast may know of a, a grocery store chain in, uh, it was started in Norwalk, Connecticut, and it's called Stu Leonard's. And Stu Leonard's has uh, the, the first rule of customer satisfaction is number one, the customer is always right. Number two, if the customer is wrong, refer to, custom, to rule number one, the customer is always right. No, of course the customer isn't always right. Sometimes they forget, sometimes they make a mistake. Um, so there are things we can do to mitigate some of those, um, some of those miscommunications, written communication, open communication are things that we do to mitigate any misunderstandings. Um, and then when things, we, when we have been unsuccessful at mitigating a, um, a, a misunderstanding, then, then we step into some of the things that we need to do to, um, to repair as opposed to prevent. So um, there are times when we do have to repair. Um, from that point of view. So the fourth key is to actually ask for the renewal, not assume it, not assume it. Um, and I know many of you work for organizations that have contract language that, is, that puts the burden on the prospect that they, if they don't let me know in 30 days, it's an auto renew, we just kick out the invoice. Those are business practices. But I think to the extent that you can get ahead of that, that builds a relationship. So if you've got those terms in your contracts, then, you know, be asking the question as we get through this, is there any reason that you would not renew at this point? Is there anything I can do? We know people are asking them, hey, when is your software subscription for this up? Do you do this? I'll just pick CRM since, you know, we're all in the sales speed, sales area, you know. I get calls all the time. What CRM do you use and when, when's your subscription up? And then it's interesting because the ones that are good, 90 days before that, all of a sudden I'm peppered with, can we meet? Can we talk? Can we, will you reevaluate what you're doing with us? So we need to understand that and we need to prevent that by understanding, do they have a reason to stay or do they have a reason to change? Ideally in a renewal situation, we're trying to create a reason to stay. Um, what now is the value they expect? What is the motivating factor for the prospect to continue with you? 
from that perspective. And then again, what we talked about is have the same rigorous qualification criteria that we have for renewals that we do with new business. The likelihood in today's environment, and certainly in many of the industries that we're working on, is the people that bought in 2020 will be in different roles, maybe even in different companies, when the renewal is comes, comes to um, term in 2021. So we need to understand that, get ahead of it, so that we're not surprised two weeks before the contracts do. We need to get ahead of that and, and do this. When I was a renewal rep, um, an account representative working with that, I always asked my prospects throughout the, um, throughout the course of the relationship, is there anything that would prevent you from renewing today if our contract term ended today? And it was amazing what you'd find out. Um, if they, they were, uh, there was an issue that they hadn't bubbled up, if there was some internal organizational things coming up with um, th that, that were going to impact the decision makers or the priorities or their go to market or whatever it might be. So good question to ask early and often is if you had to renew today, would you renew? And if it's not the ultimate renewal decision maker, would you recommend renewing? Are you getting the value that you expected to get? And can we talk about how we make sure you are? And doing that proactively is always good. So we talked about some of those questions and I got ahead of myself right here, but you know, asking those questions. Um, I, I, I talked about it, you know, if you had to rate our services on a one to 10, what would it take for us to get to 15 or 20? What it would take for us to just blow you away with the expectations that we have in doing that. And the key to asking those questions is to do them early. So you've got runway, assuming they're reasonable, it's reasonable feedback to address it. Asking that it's only at the end of the contract doesn't give you any time to respond. And so asking these questions early, often, and continuously deepens the relationships, deepens the trust, and builds opportunities for you to identify additional ways for you to support that client. Maybe it is with additional services. Maybe there are additional problems that have bubbled up since the initial purchase that you can now sell. Remember, my goal as a renewal specialist was not just to ensure that we renewed the contract. It was to expand that contract whenever and identify the potential for that. So I had to create additional need through the course of the year and the dialogues for additional programs that might not have been in the in initial solution set. And you only do that by conversation. You don't do it by saying, hey, let me tell you about my new product. You do it by saying, hey, can we talk about anything um, going on in your organization? Because there are some things that might, you might have going on that might create an opportunity for us to add additional value. So tell me about what are some of the challenges in this specific area that would create need for the new services or additional services that you have. Remember, it is all about a value. And people make emotional buying decisions for logical reasons. What we mean by that is individuals are motivated for their own reasons and they will make decisions that are in their personal best interest. And we need to leverage that personal value and personal motivation and, um, and also understand how they're gonna build the business case to justify the expense. At the end of the day, everybody's got to, to justify their purchase and we're dealing with more competing for, for limited dollars than ever before. As a matter of fact, you may, um, in one of my webinars that I did at the end of 2020, I talked about the fact that in many cases now we have two sales that we as account executives and account managers or customer success managers have to deal with. And that is we have to win the battle that we're the best solution to solve this problem set that we solve. But then we have to win the battle for the fight to capital. 
So someone's taking our proposal and the business case associated with that and going into a boardroom or maybe to a, a, a committee or a task force on capital or the CFO and having to fight for money versus competing initiatives and competing projects. So value is more important than ever. And we always want to understand both the personal value to the individuals involved and the business value associated with that. And we talked about it. If we identify something that's going on, we have to repair it as soon as possible um, if something's broken. And we need to invite people to share that with us earlier so we have the runway to do so. And oftentimes people just want to be heard. Um, and 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 heard, listened to, understood, and empathized with. But we also sometimes need to be willing to face the truth. Sometimes things don't go the way we want to. I, I manage projects and I sell people. Sometimes people make mistakes, not maliciously, but it happens. And so we just have to face the truth and deal with it when something goes sideways or something doesn't go as they expected. And oftentimes you can use your resources to do that. When things are getting um, a little bit contentious and somebody is not happy, bring in the resources to help diffuse that and, and maintain that personal relationship. Um, there's a lot to be said by, by repairing something early. Customers will be, um, have higher loyalty when they um, when they have a problem that's addressed and fixed, even if it's not fixed perfectly, than a customer who has a problem and is ignored. So we have to deal with it, even if it's uncomfortable, even if it's scary, um, and we can use our resources to help us with that. So, you know, talking about some of the preventative and restorative ways to maintain those relationships with something goes done, does go wrong. Here are a couple of ideas of things you can do. Putting things in writing is always a valuable thing. It helps minimize the fact that there's a misunderstanding. Now, there can still be a misunderstanding with a written message, but it helps eliminate that. Let's face it, when someone leaves a meeting and we make a commitment to them, they're off to the next meeting and they may forget it, they may, um, or they may uh, not remember it completely. So we want it, we want to do that. And, and also just being upfront and being accountable. That's part of what it takes to be a business professional today. And then there's a couple strategies for restoring things when things go wrong. Again, I have found that when you own it, people respect that even if you can't completely fix it, they respect the ownership, taking responsibility, acknowledging that. Um, and, um, and oftentimes when you can turn those people around, you truly have a customer for life. So here's what I would suggest you do. Now, for many of you, you just went through a huge renewal set season at the end of December. Many clients operate on a calendar year. Many budgets operate on a calendar year. So if you are have just gone through that renewal season and the new business season, and you're now starting out a new year with new clients, you know, take some of these tactics uh, from onboarding to managing expectations to putting together a value added um, calendar of ways that you can reach out um, and maintain contact and build relationship with those individuals today. Assess what, what the health of uh, individual renewals are. Uh, we still have a number of, of, of things that we'll be renewing in the first quarter and second quarter and, and third quarter. Do you have that mapped out? Do you know what those activities are on a monthly basis based on where those clients are? Have an outreach strategy to, to contact all those people. How can you add value? What's new? What's going on? How can you create new need? And then um, from a customer retention plan, I always find it's great. Let's, let's work and collaborate with the prospect. What are things that you can do and get their buy-in to do with you and then document that plan to make sure that you're on track to get the results and realize the value that they have. So there's a lot of things that we can do today, even if we don't have renewals facing us until you know much later in the future. There's a lot of things you can do with the new um, uh, contracts, contacts, 
clients uh, that have been handed over to a customer success manager um, that you can start with. If you have new territory, um, there's a lot of things you can do to go meet with your existing install base and understand, hey, what do you expect? How can I add value? Is everything going the way you want it to do? What do I do to move from a 10 to a 15? If you had to renew today, would you and, 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 and get really ahead of any of those challenges? Our goal is to minimize, if not eliminate, the uncontrolled, or excuse me, the controllable cancels. We can't deal with the company going out of business, but we can deal with the companies that are staying in business and continuing to operate, that they see enough value with us that there's no reason for them to even talk to a competitive alternative because that would just be a waste of their time.